Now, did they, because obviously we want to believe it's all real, but did they not get along? (laughs) Did they not get along because of sort of just their approach to working? Or on the on the movie, or was it was it a pure personality conflict? We have a saying in the UK that you're never more than a couple of feet from a rat in London, because there are so many rats. And we say at Smooth Radio, you're never more than a couple of feet from a dirty dancing track on Smooth Radio. And the reason is because it's so beloved. It's so beloved yeah. by our listeners. They absolutely love it. And I'm sure I don't have to tell you that because um, the, the reason why you're here still talking about it because everybody loves it so much 35 years on. So come on then, tell me how it came about. You're all working as musicians anyway, weren't you? So tell me how it came about that you um, came to write the music for this movie? Well, there's two different stories. You know, one, one story <clears throat> that Stacy has, because Stacy had a relationship with uh, uh, Patrick, which uh, he'll tell that story. And John and I were working on a uh, next Frankie and the Knockouts record, which uh, was a band that I was in back in 1981 that had several hit records on uh, Millennium RCA records with a gentleman named Jimmy Einer. <clears throat> and so Jimmy Einer decided he wanted to go into the film industry and shut his label down. And so for maybe a couple of years, I was with uh, MCA records, and then I was back home selling cars out of my driveway, <laughs> trying to make enough bucks to you know, take my voice lesson and you know, live my life. And uh, I started writing songs for the next Frankie and the Knockout fourth album. And John and I, through a mutual friend, David Prater, got introduced. And David Prater said, had a little studio in his basement, said, I got this really great track from this guy named John D. Nicola, and I want to play it for you. So he played me the track, and I was like, you know what, I like, I really like it. And he, I said, let me, let me try to write something. So he gave me John's number. I called John and John said, sure, you know, write something. So the very first song that John and I wrote was called Hungry Eyes. Oh, and and so that was wrong. Great. That was, what, what, a yeah, first, that, what a first one out the traps. That's a hell of a start. Yeah. You know? And so John and I were on this roll writing, you know, maybe six or seven more songs together and, out of the blue, this guy, Jimmy Einer, who went on to film, called me and said, listen, I have this little movie. I want you to write a song for it. He said, Jimmy, 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 stop. I don't have time for your little movie. I said, I'm trying to get a record deal. You went on to do something else. Let me try to, you know, get another deal. And he goes, no, no, no. This movie's going to change your life. And I go, right. He's going to change my life. I kind of thinking, well, he kind of did that when he shut his label. So he, you know, said, you know, I feel good about this movie, gave me a little description. And I said, okay, okay, Uh, you know, you got me, I'll write, I'll write something. I said, what's the name of the movie? And he went on to say, Dirty Dancing. And my hand went to my forehead and I thought, Jimmy's doing porn. (laughs) (laughs) I thought he was doing a porn Uh, By the way, I have a question before you carry on. Did that make you more keen to do it or less? Oh, I was all in. (laughs) I was all in then. So I I thought, you know what? I'm going to call up my friend, John D. Nicola, because we have a connection and we're writing really good songs together. And I told him what had happened. And I said, the good news is we got a song that we have, we can write, but we're one of 149 other songs that got submitted. So we're not, we don't have the gig. We're just writing as part and parcel of 149 other people. And so I said, the the bad news is that it has to be seven minutes long because it's the last song of the movie and it has to be seven minutes. I'm thinking we got to write MacArthur Park, you know, or something equivalent. (laughs) So John, I tell John what's happening. He sends me this incredible track that he, kind of put together with Don Markowitz. 
And in the car, on the Garden State Parkway, in the state of New Jersey, I pay the toll. I put, I put the cassette into my dashboard and I'm listening to John's track going, na 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 I'm of my life, na 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 I'm of my life. And I'm scribbling time of my life on an envelope. And the man upstairs wrote the rest of the song. So that's the beginning of how this all started to answer your question. Long-winded, but that's it. No, it's an incredible story. And, and you know, that song, uh, well, all the songs, but The Time of My Life, that song is, um, I mean, it is just touches people in the most extraordinary way, doesn't it? It is it is something about the emotion of it, I guess also where it's placed in the movie with the coming together of the everything that the people watching the movie, the journey they've been on. And there's just something about that idea of, of justice at the end of it, of people getting their moment. And I'm sure you've seen the thousands of attempts at the lift on that key bit. <laughs> you know, I've been to at least five weddings where the yeah. couples have attempted it. Uh, I mean, uh, even at that moment, you know, did you, uh, maybe one of the others can answer as well. Did you have a sense that, wow, you know, we have written something extraordinary here. You know, there was not really a sense. Um, it was really no way of knowing. For us, it was, you know, just like every other song. In fact, it's sort of an odd, not an odd song, but I mean, it wasn't the contemporary vernacular mm -hmm. music of 87, you know. So, you know, you would have to shoot your mind back to 1963 which is what it uh, it did you know Jimmy Einer added um, Bill Medley as a vocalist of course the famous Righteous Brother vocalist which is immediate tie to 1963 our, our version of the time of my life which Frankie sang with our friend Rochelle Capelli is what they filmed the demo I'm, I'm sorry they filmed the movie to our demo and it was a lot more synth bass and drum machine which is what the vernacular of the day was and and uh michael lloyd and and jimmy uh brought real drums and real bass to try and pull it to 1963 and um so the song you know as i said you know you always think you wrote a good song but um you know it it wasn't a necessarily because of the the different um music of the day it wasn't like oh well this is of course this is going to number yeah. one so you know and, and i think the movie um brought the attention to the song and then as we've said before then the song started started bringing attention to the movie you know so it was a, a real um you know they worked for for each other it was the com it was a culmination of all those things that created a phenomenon you know where patrick jennifer Bill Medley, this song, um, Eleanor's little script. You know, I, I, I think you're right. I think there was, there, there's sometimes a little bit of kismet. You mentioned the man upstairs. Uh, things come together in the most beautiful way, don't they? Uh, and Stacey, you haven't told your story yet, have you? How did you come to get involved? I had moved to LA in 1981 with my girlfriend, Wendy, who is Wendy Fraser, who's the singer on She's Like the Wind, the, the woman that comes in. And, um, we were writing music for television. We had written the theme for the Richard Simmons show and um, uh, Regis Philbin and all these different television, daytime television shows. And a friend of mine asked me to come play piano for him in his acting class. He wanted to do a musical scene. And, uh, you know, I was an experienced accompanist. So uh, I did the scene and in the break, there were about 60, actors in in the class studying i could see a, a young alec baldwin was in the class and tom Selleck was in the class and and but this guy came up to me as i was clearing the music up and he introduced himself as buddy and i said you know you look really familiar to me and after talking and meeting his wife we discovered that we lived around the block from each other and that was patrick swayze because wow. uh, because Friends and family called him Buddy, so that's how he how he I always knew him, um, and still refer to him. You know, I'm still good friends with his wife, 
Uh, and um, so anyway, in 1984 or so, uh, he called me and he said, I'm working on this movie called Grandview USA. They're looking for songs. Um, do you want to work on something with me? I've had this idea for a song for a while, but I can't get anywhere with it. So I said, yeah, sure. Come on over. He lived around the block. So he came over with his guitar uh, in the evening and I was at my piano and he had two chords that he repeated over and over. Uh, but a lot of lyrics, like lists of lyrics. And I really liked the first two lines, which is, she's like the wind through my tree. She rides the night next to me. I thought, well, that's intriguing. But I didn't like the third and fourth lines. Well, and wait, told tell him, me. I can't remember to this day. I immediately, uh, you know, just said, I don't, I don't like the third and fourth line. And he got defensive. And uh, we were already very good friends at this point. So he looked at me and said, well, what would you say? And I just thought for a minute and I said, she leads me through moonlight only to burn me with the sun. And he looked at me and said, what does that mean? And I said, I don't care, just write it down. <laughs> and then we moved it musically to some other places to get it off the two chords. Um, and really the moment when it clicked was when we realized that she's like the wind is not just the opening line of the song, that it's also the title and the hook. Uh, and that that comes back in. And inadvertently, we did a, a very brilliant thing, which is by having that uh, kind of signature musical intro, and then the first line being, she's like the wind, people immediately know what song it is. Yeah. It's not like they have to wait through the chorus. As, as we say in Nashville, don't bore us, get to the chorus. It's, uh, you know, it's, um, uh, it was just an inadvertent move because neither of us were really songwriters per se. Um, you know, I was more involved and focused more on doing scoring work, writing to picture and, and things like that. But, you know, it, you asked before about, did we know that we wrote a great song? Um, we liked the song. We did a great demo of it with him singing it and like I said, my then girlfriend, Wendy, doing some parts on it. And, but the, the scuttlebutt on the film in the lead up to its release was that it was terrible, that it was going to be in the theaters for one week only and then go straight to video because the production company was a video company, Vestron. And I remember seeing it at the cast and crew screening before it was released, Wendy and I went. And we walked out of there saying, you know, that's not nearly as bad as everybody is saying it was. It was actually pretty good, you know, a little cheesy in parts, but otherwise pretty good. And so it was really a, a shock to everyone, including Buddy, you know, enormously when the movie exploded as it did. And then Time My Life shot up to number one and the album shot up to number one. And so it, it was really it surprised everybody and, and took us all, you know, it was it was a shock. Patrick, or Buddy as you call him. Right. Um, when you when you saw, and I know as part of your tour of celebration of 35 years of dirty dancing, you're releasing some unseen footage, aren't you, of them performing the movie to your version uh, of, of the song, um, of various songs. Um, when, um, when he was on the movie, did, did you get a sense? Because we all feel like his heart was in that movie, that he kind of loved it, the fact that he got involved in the writing of the music, the fact that it, it just has a very much of a him stamped all over him. Knowing it as you do, do you think he, he loved being part of it, even though he didn't know, just like no one did, that it was going to be a success? I believe he, he did because... Um... First off, he was that way with any project he was doing, but he was also, he could be a little difficult. And there's, you know, notorious, you know, and, and Jennifer Gray's writing a little more openly about it now that the two of them really did not get along. Uh, I'm, I'm but, terribly disappointed by this. Now, did they, because obviously we want to believe it's all real, but did right. they not get along? <laughs> did they not get along because of sort of just their approach to working? Or on the on the movie, or was it was it a pure personality conflict? No, they had worked together on a movie previously called Red Dawn, and I think some of his issues with her went back to there. But there's one scene in the movie 
that's absolutely telling where they're rehearsing and he's sliding his hand down her side and she yeah. has her arm up and she that's keeps unreal. laughing. And that was not acted. She was actually ticklish and she kept ruining the takes. And so when you see him turning away, kind of annoyed and disgusted, that was really his reaction and was brilliant for Emil Ardolino, the director, to actually to, to keep those scenes because they were so spontaneous. They had a really natural flavor. And, and actually the way it's cut into the movie, it's like two people who are opposing sort of coming together, isn't it? And little did we know that that was real as we yeah. watched. She said recently that I read um, that, that they're sort of at odds with each other. She thought added a little to the kind of sexual tension that you felt, you know. So she thought it yeah. kind of worked for yeah. them. At least that's so what she said recently. When, when I met Patrick, it was uh, first met him, it was at the Academy Awards. And he kind of like sussed me out and, and uh, said, I need to talk to you. And I need to talk to you about the song. And I said, well, what's up? Who sang the demo? And I, I said, okay, that was Rochelle Capelli, the female and, and myself. And I said, well, why is that important? And he goes, because, he goes, we didn't have a song. We had listened to 149 songs. We're getting ready to film, I think to a Lionel Richie track that they rehearsed and they were like, you know, this movie's not happening. You know, we, we don't have an original song. It's a good song, Lionel Richie song, but it's not uh, an original. Let's get this piece of shit over with. And so I was like, really? And he goes, and then Emil Ardolino walks in and goes, I got one more cassette, the 150th cassette. We might as well listen to it. And he said, so we played that cassette and we looked at each other and just were like, is this a great song or are we really desperate? You know, <laughs> so basically those, both of those things, they happened to be a very good song and they were desperate for a good song. And because at the end of the day, we just looked at each other and went, what a great ending. Let's go make a movie. And so I think he said, because of that, the camaraderie did a, did a 180. And we all just like really got into making this movie. And then they filmed Hungry Eyes to the demo again to me singing Hungry Eyes. So, you know, John and I and, and Don Markowitz actually, we sell those demos to raise money for pancreatic cancer. So if you went to Facebook and went to Dirty Dancing Demos, you could own a piece of that history if you're a big Dirty Dancing fan and then you'll be donating to the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network. So I think that's a really important thing, but an insight to Patrick's mindset. You've obviously carried on and you have your own lives and families. I wonder if you've, um, you know, you've seen over the last 35 years, how it seeped into maybe children you have or, you know, an ongoing and, uh, and people suddenly having that moment where they go, oh my God, you wrote that, you know. Uh, I wonder if there's been moments where you've thought, wow, you know, that, that has touched people. I'd be, be interested to know on, on some of those as well. Well, it's, that, that's the extraordinary part of it. That's where my sense of pride comes from, is that when you have songs like ours that are evergreens, you have this span of decades of it affecting generations of people. And I just had it last Saturday. I, I had a, a photography show, uh, doing photography now also. And uh, I had a show here in Nashville at a gallery and my bio was up next to one of the photos. And, you know, there was this woman reading the bio and all of a sudden I saw her just go huh, like this. And then, you know, I introduced myself and she actually was tearing up. I mean, she said, I can't believe I'm meeting you. I, you know, this song is so important to me. And I've had it also where I met cancer survivors, a, a woman who when she, she and her husband found out that they were, that she was in remission, they danced to She's Like the Wind under the moonlight uh, after setting up a stereo outside. So you get to hear stories like these over the years that really remind you why you went into the business to begin with. These particular songs have created a phenomenon and, and generation after generation pass, pass it on. 
and with there going to be a new movie with, with Jennifer doing another form of dirty dancing, you know, I would hope to think that um, they'll be passed on to another generation. Well, I've had the, you know, I'm the generation that watched it and loved it. And I've got children of 16 and 12. And there was a moment with my daughter as I thought, oh my God, I know what we could do. You, I, I, this is the moment for mother and daughter to watch Dirty Dancing. It feels like a moment and I'd been waiting for her to grow old enough to it. Although I have to say, as I embarked upon it, I think she was quite tough. I thought, wow, there are some quite risque scenes in here, which I don't remember watching when I saw it the first time. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and the things that you don't remember is that uh, when you're suddenly it's you're, you're the mum but um, we watched it and, and she was blown away by it again and my son was too and there is a power isn't there in the music in that sense of sort of awakening of understanding where you might take your life there's all of that in there which is which is just makes it so magical I think doesn't it a coming of age which bizarrely seems to touch people of any age it's yeah. that sort seizing the day and trying to take things forward and not being held back and having your moment which I guess is is in there in all of us whatever age we are it, it's a it's a beautiful thing how I mean we have sadly you know 35 years on you're here we're able to talk about it you're talking about Patrick you're talking about Jennifer as well but Patrick isn't here I mean going through his passing what what was that like for those that knew him and how important was he to the success of it, I guess? I'm lucky to have had dinner with him and Lisa uh, and his brother Donnie, actually, at their uh, ranch um, about a year and a half. He was sick at this point, but still in fairly decent shape. Um, and uh, it was, it, I remember it was a friend of mine that called me and just said, are you okay? And I knew immediately that he had died, that somebody was calling me to tell me that he had, had died. And I, I remember I had a songwriting session set up uh, here in Nashville at my house and they showed up and I said, I can't, I can't, I can't do this today. I'm sorry, but you'll have to go home. And um, I spoke at his memorial service, which was about a month or so after he died. Uh, it was very funny. I walked into the memorial service about... 150, 200 people there. It's being hosted by Whoopi Goldberg because of their work together in Ghost. Lisa comes up to me and says, I want you to tell like a little funny story about Buddy. And I looked at her and I said, you know, you could have called me last week so I could have prepared something. And I said also, and you want me to tell a funny story in front of Whoopi Goldberg. And so she said, <laughs> yeah. But he, you know, it, it's interesting. I, at his <laughs> memorial, I sat next to Jennifer Gray. And uh, she cried for three hours straight. She just absolutely sobbed for three hours. It was, it was uh, uh, amazing the impact that, you know, despite whatever they di differences they had while shooting, the impact that he had in her life was enormous. Uh, and what do you think Dirty Dancing, your Dirty Dancing, what do you think its legacy will be? Well, we can only hope, you know, that, um, that our songs live on forever yeah. and that is after generation passed it on because of the power of Patrick and the movie and the song. And uh, I think that it would be great to know that Patrick Swayze's legacy lived on, you know, and, and to me that's part and parcel of the power of Dirty Dancing and our songs. I would think all three songs in 35 years will be, you know, just like Play It Again, Sam, you know, from, right. you know, I think that all three will be still in the, you know, classic vernacular of uh, music, you know, song. If they've made it this far, they'll make it exactly. further. It's like the old, if, if you make it to 90 years old, you'll probably make it to 100. So it's, uh, it, it's a similar type of thing. But also the the legacy of the movie is there are great socially conscious themes that underpin the movie. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons why it remains relevant to this day, not just the chemistry of, of the main characters, um, the beautiful scenes between father and daughter. I mean, Jerry Orbach is unbelievable in those scenes. Yes. And, and then also the love of dancing. 
that uh, I think that that is a legacy in this as well. It's not just the music. We, it's, it's funny because when I first met Buddy in his acting class, one of the things I said, because I got involved in the discussion with the teacher is, the saying in musical theater is that when your emotions are too great to speak, you sing. And the dancers retort to that is, yes, and when your emotions are too great to sing, you dance. This young woman discovers herself, but she discovers herself through movement and dance. Oh my goodness, I cannot tell you what uh, an incredible pleasure it is for me, because obviously I, I listen to your music all the time. Uh, I listen to it for fun, as well as for laying it on, on the show. And, and, you know, you're part of something which uh, in the US, uh, but all around the world, including here in the UK, is so massive and has touched so many people's lives. So thank you. What they learn from each other feels too good to be wrong. Dirty Dancing, starring Patrick Swayze, Jennifer Grey, and Cynthia Rhodes. Get ready for the time of your life.